Hello and welcome to this World Cup Q&A brought to you by Sports Bar and Grill. I'm joined by England international Beth England and Tottenham Hotspur star Renee Hector. We're here to talk about the World Cup and what a tournament it's been so far. It's had a bit of everything, hasn't it? It's had controversy, it's had quality, it's had goals, it's had everything. And Beth, you've just gone back from France to see some of the action. What was the atmosphere like? Yeah, I mean, the Cameroon game was crazy. I think to be in that atmosphere when all that stuff was kicking off, not knowing VAR, getting very controversial decisions, but I thought they were correct decisions. Obviously, Cameroon highly disagreed, but um, yeah, being in and around that environment and being able to go and watch skills play was a great experience. And I think it just shows how far the game's come because those thousands in the crowd then, so it was really good to be part of. It feels like there's a real buzz around this World Cup. How special is it? I think it's huge. I think for any little girl out there dreaming of playing for the country one day, or the women out there pioneering the, the way forward for them, it's just so massive for every single little girl that wants that dream and that these girls are playing out there proving that that dream can become a reality. So again, I think to know anything that's going on in the women's game has been finally showed across through a lot more media is amazing for the women's game. I think it's really important as well. I remember uh, the last World Cup four years ago, um, sort of staying up till, till stupid o'clock, sort of 2, 3 a.m. watching it because obviously it was in it was in Canada. So it, it's obviously a really positive thing this year that that it's on at a reasonable time so that so that everybody can actually watch it. And obviously it's on BBC, which is a huge platform. Um, so there, there's no surprise that we're sort of breaking records for figures. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really positive step as well to also grow in the women's game. Renee, who's stood out for you so far? Who's impressed you? Um, do you know what? I think Diani of, of France on the, on the right wing, I think she's absolutely unbelievable. Um, obviously, as a defender myself, if I saw her turn and run towards me, I uh, know I'd, I'd, be, I'd be in a bit of trouble. Um, I think she can go both ways. She's extremely skillful. She's got a good end product. She's aggressive, direct. Um, and for me, she's been France's best player by far. Really exciting player to watch. Beth? For me, I think I'd say Aslani for Sweden. She really impressed me the other night, especially, and the assist that she gave for the team to score their goal, their winning goal. Um, again, like Renee said, like she's direct, she can use both feet, she's, she's got a decent pace about her. So I think any defender's nightmare, really, just someone going like that towards, towards your goal. But, I think she's been a great asset for Sweden and getting them through to the next round of the quarters has been unbelievable. There's been plenty of goals. What's What's been the goal so far? Goal in the tournament, Beth? Oh, for me, 100% Thailand's goal, um, which sounds bad because it's against Sweden and it's our players, but like, at the, the proudness from their manager and the players, after they just come off that 13 mil battering from yeah. America, um, for him to turn themselves around and score the first ever World Cup goal for me was just the complete highlight of the, of the tournament for me. I, there could be any other worldie scored, but to see them <laughs> girls put all that effort in and not give up after, again, being on the back end of that beat to, uh, loss from USA is, is, was amazing to watch that one for me. Um, for me, not quite so sentimental, but uh, in, the, in the game yesterday, Japan, um, Netherlands, I thought Japan's goal was unbelievable. Um, obviously, they're playing nice little intricate football, in really tight areas, um, sort of a one-two touch passing in and around the box, which is difficult. Um, I think most most teams are, can be quite comfortable keeping the ball along the back and in the midfield, but it really shows what a great team you are if you can keep the ball in, in sort of the final third. And obviously, they showed that they can do that. Um, they sort of, Netherlands had no chance, they absolutely popped them out of position, nice little nutmeg at the end um, and finished it superbly. I thought that was, that was definitely sort of the, uh, the best technical goal I've seen. They were hard done by, I think, Japan. Yeah, yeah, like, I think Netherlands were throwing a bit of a lifeline with that penalty, especially with no ruling. But like you say, Japan, they, at one point I saw a 2v3 playing out from the back in their own box against Netherlands front press. Like, 
to have that sort of creativeness to be able to get out of them situations in such a high stressful moment for me, I felt that they were unbelievable yesterday. Plan didn't make the last eight, but the Lionesses have. Big game coming up. How far do you think they can go? I'd like to say that they can go and win it. Um, as we saw in the last World Cup, they've only strengthened in character and players and everything, so I think anything's possible. But for me, their biggest test is yet to come in Norway. Sure as hell, going to give them one of the toughest games that they've faced so far in this tournament. So I think they're going to all have to be on their A game, um, making sure that they're not turning over, stopping possession at the back. I think even watching the Scotland game, giving away silly passes from the back which led to him was conceding a goal so I think as long as they're nice and tight at the back and I mean the forwards are doing their job they're scoring the goal so as long as we just keep it tight at the back and forwards put it in the back of the net they really we shouldn't have a problem really. Yeah no I think Beth hit the, hit the nail on the head there um, in terms of I think England have in patches been, been really good and creative but we have seen that they have been a bit sloppy at the back. I mean, against a better team, if you're you're a centre back and you're giving the ball away to the number ten of the opposition, then you're screaming for problems. Especially since we we play such direct and, and attacking football with the, the full backs bombing forward. If you're then giving the ball away in those areas, then obviously there's a lot of space to exploit. But I do believe that England have definitely got the depth within the squad to beat any team on any day. If they're on their A game and they, and they tighten it up at the back and, and sort of nullify those issues, I do genuinely think that they have got the capability to go on and, and beat the likes of USA, France, whoever it may be um, at that stage. But yeah, I'm going with England. So who do we expect to see in Phil's starting 11 tomorrow then? That's anyone's guess, obviously. Um, as we've seen in the news today, Steph's and Money's having a bit of issues. I think the virus is going around the council. Um, he looks prepared for these moments. He's, he's took a full squad, knowing that every single player within that squad can fill in any position and, and do the job that he's asking of them. Uh, it's a great squad to be a part of. Um, obviously, for myself, I'd like to see Fran start again, obviously being uh, one of my friends at Chelsea. Uh, I think the back four, again, it's been mixed up that much. You, you don't know who's going to play. You can't guarantee on, like you say, the, this virus issue that they're saying is going around. You can't confirm it. But as long as they just keep it tight and not give away silly silly passes. Um, I know, like, working on the field myself, he's very much like risk takers, so I can appreciate, like, trying to get that perfect ball is a risk you have to take but sometimes it's knowing when to take that risk when you're if you're under the cosh a bit and you need to settle the game but um yeah i think it's going to be a pretty similar team to what we've already seen i can't imagine too much changes um for me i i think ellen's been our strongest most consistent performer throughout this tournament it's even scoring the goals that she scored creating stuff out of nothing against some of the team, she's, she's held the ball up well, she's strong, physical, she'll run until she can't run anymore. Um, so yeah, as long as they just keep it tight and play the players that we know are performing, I think it'll be a good chance. Yeah, I think the saving grace is, is that Phil likes to rotate the squad a lot, so in terms of Steph and Millie, if they're not able to play, at least the likes of Abby McManus and Leah Williamson have had that playing time and, and had that experience of of playing for England, I think that will sort of take the nerves away from them a little bit if they are called upon. Um, but as Beth says, I think Ellen White has to start. I think that's crucial. Um, and not even just in terms of her goals, but her energy. And I think that will be extremely important in a game against Norway because we know that they've obviously got two very good number nines that are probably going to try and pin the centre backs. And a player like Ellen will go and chase lost causes, will go and put pressure on the players at the back to try and stop them playing that long ball into those um, into those danger players. Um, so for me, Ellen White has to start. I think Nikita Paris has to start. Um, and obviously Lucy Bronze, I think yeah. that, that that partnership between Nikita and, and Lucy Bronze is unbelievable and probably one of the best partnerships on the side of the pitch in the, in the World Cup so far. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the back line. I'm very excited about the game. But going back to the Cameroon 
debacle. England held their heads high and we've got to thank them for that. It was incredible to see. But Cameroon, I mean, Frank Herbert, your Chelsea teammate, said that she's never ever seen anything like that, ever. Is that something that you've ever witnessed playing, playing women's football? Personally, no, I'd like, say I was in the stands and just being in the atmosphere and watching it all escalate. I was getting text messages from my family about, because obviously in the stands you don't know what's going on on the media side, so all the interviews at half time with the managers, you don't have anything. And when you hear that they're like, people are protesting basically to come out, um, was a bit of a shock. And I think uh, I read an article um, just today about how the referee ended up overturning two VAR decisions, which one was the horrible tattoo on Steph, which in my eyes should have been a red card. Um, and I think Steph was very lucky to come away without anything majorly serious. And then as well, there was a penalty appeal against Fran um, as well, which I think the ref should have given, but chose not to on the basis of she was worried that the Cameroon had players have threatened that much that they leave the pitch that she needed to, that was her way I think of taking control of the game which I don't think the game was ever really taken into control by any of the officials I thought it was just madness from start to finish and again I can't praise the players enough for how they conducted themselves not reacting to what the Cameron players did and they really tried to get under their skin and as you saw Phil's interview at the end how unhappy he was about how it doesn't show what women's football is, I think it was it was a good display from England but a very poor display from Cameroon in my eyes. Yeah, no, I think it was it was to be honest a bit of a disgrace the way that Cameroon conducted themselves. I think they were they need to count their lucky stars that they ended up with everybody on the pitch because for me that there was three blatant red cards. Yeah. Obviously you've got the elbow to Nikita Paris, which to me was completely deliberate. That wasn't a natural movement of the arm. She purposely elbowed her in the face. You've got the spitting on the arm of Tony Duggan, which I think is just the lowest of the low. Um, that is obviously a blatant red card. And then obviously you've got the tackle on Steph, which is horrendous. There's no intent for the ball at all. She's intended to go and hurt her. Um, and I think that, you know, you've got to give a lot of credit to England because, you know, before they're players, um, they're people. And, you know, obviously, we're obviously, as, as football players, we all get really emotional during games. We all disagree with referee decisions. You know, we're all passionate, have lots of desire, but there's a certain line that you don't cross. And I think that, that Cameroon crossed that line and England um, as a whole done very well to not react because at the end of the day, you wouldn't be able to walk down the street and spit on someone and then not react. So, Kudos to them for, for staying professional, staying calm and just getting the job done. So I think that the way that England conducted themselves has sent out a very good message to, to young people and young girls watching. Well said. As we know, Scotland are out of the World Cup. They'll be hugely disappointed, naturally. But how can they build on their experiences in the World Cup going forward? Well, I mean, for me, the fact that they qualified just showed how far they've come over the past few years. I think they had a great campaign leading up to the World Cup and I think they were a bit hard done by in, um, in some of the games. I thought they played some good football, like they, they definitely tested England um, to the wire again, only 2-1, it was a close result and then th their last game for me just, they need to start and realise that when they're in a position such as they were winning 3-0, they need to really turn down how they can keep that lead without giving away too much because to, to lose a 3-0 lead when it's potentially going to qualify you for the last round of 16 you need to have heads on that pitch that are going to manage that and to give away such a sloppy penalty towards the end just I think showed up how their their rounds kind of went um, I, was, I was gutted for them especially obviously Erin and like there's quite a few girls I know in the Scotland team but if you're not conducting yourself in a position where you can hold that lead, knowing it's such a vital game, I think they need to learn how to manage them situations better because everyone wants to be in a World Cup and it, to, they make history by getting there in the first place, scoring their first goal in the World Cup, but again, to, to see them give away that 3-0 lead for me was just sloppy and I think that they need to really learn from that 
experience of knowing how to manage it, even if it's just slowing the clock down a little bit or just little tactical things that anyone can do or just, just manage it better because they, for me, I think they played well enough to be in the round of 16 but their last game just ruined all that hard work for them in my eyes. Yeah, no, I do feel sorry for Scotland. I think that um, initially, anyway, they were put in a tough group yeah. with, with England and Japan. Um, but we need to bear in mind that this is this is Scotland's first World Cup in there, and they've played against two teams that are in the top ten in the world. Um, I'm not sure where Scotland are ranked in the world, um, but they're playing the likes of obviously England and Japan, who are comfortably in the top ten in the world, and they give, they gave those two teams a run for their money and gave them a scare. Um, Obviously, as Beth said, when you're 3-0 up against the team, it's not acceptable to let them come back to 3-3 in the last 15 minutes. That's obviously poor game game management, but I think going forward, they can really, really take a lot of positives from, from this competition and know that actually they can compete with the best in the world because they've, they've played against a, a team that got into the World Cup final last year. You're playing against a team that's third in the world and you've almost got something out of both of those games. Um, so they can take a lot of positives and I think that they'll they'll learn and with time they'll only get more experience in terms of that game management and, and making sure that there are leaders on the pitch to to make sure that you know the result doesn't slip away from them again. But I'm sure next time they'll get into the next World Cup and they'll do better and they'll get through to the knockout stages and they'll give those, those good teams in the world a, a good run for their money. It's been an incredible World Cup, World Cup, as we know, but best moment, Renee, best moment of the game. Um, I think the best moment, um, as Beth probably mentioned earlier, was that Thailand goal, because I do remember I, I, was, I, I did a podcast and was watching that, that USA game, and with every goal that went in, my heart broke a little bit more and more and more. And I thought, oh gosh, like this is almost getting like humiliating for them. Um, and and if I'm honest, I didn't I didn't believe that they probably score a goal against any of the other teams. They just seemed like quite a weak team, just in general. Um, but to see them score that goal, but not only to score them goal, to watch the coaches on the side like sobbing because they were so proud. Um, I think that 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 one goal meant a lot to the whole country it wasn't just it wasn't then just about a game of football or about the world cup it was about thailand as a country and, and i think that goal um and i think it made like sort of the whole country proud that's sort of the, the feel that i got especially with the, the coach's reaction on the side so that's the moment of the tournament for me yeah, I think I can completely agree with them. Like as, as I touched on before, just to see their faces scoring that goal, as they made point of, it made their country proud. But I think it also made every other country within the World Cup proud for them because I know that a lot of people I've spoken to as well felt that same like amazingness towards the fact that they scored their first goal and just seeing their faces because not everyone can get to a World Cup like. We're sat here, we're, we're not playing in the World Cup, these girls are playing in the World Cup and they gave everything they could for their country. But just to see them score that goal, for me, was unbelievable. And it's, that's what football's about, it's about the love of the game. And I can't reiterate enough how much like it could have destroyed them going from that USA game to, to trying to actually play again. They could have just given up completely and turned down and got another another spanking, really. But they, they showed up, they tried. Although the game was 4-1 in the end for Sweden, they pushed, they gave them as, as best as they could give and um, yeah, I think, I think that was an unbelievable moment. It takes a lot of mental strength, like you yeah. say, to show up, having known that the whole world has just seen Watched. a demolition. Yeah. So yeah, kudos to, to Thailand. Yeah, exactly. For, for me, it wasn't within the game, but one of the most amazing moments of seeing Brazilian legend Marta's plea in her post-match interview, so that, that emotive plea to the next generation to get young girls to come and get involved in football, and I was, I was, I was so moved by it. I don't know if you guys were as well. That just shows me why she's such a legend of the game. Like, even the little things down to she doesn't wear a sponsor on her boots, she's got an equal rights logo on her boots because she's fighting 
for everything that the younger generation are going to do to him. She's gone through so much to, like, she scored in every, every World Cup that she's played in. I think it's five consecutive World Cups now. Same as um, Sinclair for Canada. Like, that's an unbelievable achievement. And yeah, again, the the message she was putting across definitely moved me. Like, to the point where. It just shows the passion for the game, and like she says, these these idols are not going to be around forever. And, and unless you start to believe and put in the work that these women have put in before you, you'll never achieve what they've already been able to set the path for you. So I, I thought it was an unbelievable interview, and um, it's quite sad at the same point that you know it's probably going to be her last World Cup to have such a idolistic character in the women's game. That, out to it now, but it was yeah, no, I think she she's spot on with what she said that it's down to now the next generation to keep pushing the game forward and to make it better than what it is now. Because obviously, women's football has come a long way since the since the last World Cup, and we can see that in terms of the breaking records for figures and and stuff like that. And to to have someone like Marta set the standard for the players coming through. Um, it's, it's just an inspiration. Obviously, as Beth said, she's got the, the equal rights um, symbol on her boot and the few sort of boot sponsors. Um, and they've done so much for the women's game that I'm sure a lot of a lot of the younger girls coming through won't really know about, won't really know sort of the, the hardship and stuff that the older players have had to go through to get to where we are now. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that message was, was so, so, so strong. Um, and I think now it's it's up to sort of those those players that are now sort of in their mid twenties or whatever to, to take the baton from from those players and to keep driving it forward. And then in five years' time, it will be the next lot. And I think that it will it will only get stronger and stronger. You're both stars of the game in your own right. What message would you say would you have for a young girl? Trying to get into sport, women's football. Just if you're going to do it, do it with everything you've got. Don't hold back. But for me, the most important thing I think is that you have to enjoy it because if you don't enjoy it, you'll never get the best out of yourself and you'll never get or reach your potential because we we do this job because we love it. It's one of the biggest love in our life. As much as it is our job, it's still something that we love, and I don't think without that enjoyment you can never really hit that potential so just give it everything you've got don't let anyone tell you you can't do it because I've had people in my time thinking that I was never going to make it and now like my full-time job is to play football and it's, it's been my dream since I was a little girl even though I never thought it would be possible so just keep working hard keep your mentally, mental focus strong because I don't think a lot of people realise how mentally draining it can be as well I think everyone and the fans see the fun side of it all we get to start on pitch and play but they don't see the background of all the hardness that you have to put in and difficult conversations you have with family, friends, managers, agents, like there's so many things involved and for a little girl, like you said, these women are paving the way for you to just walk into a, a great environment where you can do the job that you love. It's like you, you touched on, like women before that have to work double jobs as well as try and play and now little girls are not going to have to do that anymore because that path is formed for you. So just make sure you enjoy it, give every single ounce of energy and motivation you've got to succeed in what you want to do, whether that be football or any other sport that you love. Yeah, as Beth said, I think it's so key, like, you, you have to believe in yourself and you can't let anyone tell you different. As long as you believe that you can make it and that you're good enough, then that's the case, but then you've got to work hard for it. And you know what? There will be setbacks, there will be disappointment, there will be times where you're told you're not good enough, there will be times where you're told, oh, you're not quite the right player. Um, you know, and it, and it will be tough, but you, if you believe in yourself, then you can do anything and you have to keep going through those tough times. I'm sure all of us as footballers, we've all had some sort of issue, whether it be injury, whether it be uh, certain coaches haven't believed in you, and you don't get on with some of your teammates, it could be anything, but 
you have to keep going and you have to be mentally strong. Um, and as Beth said, you have to love it. You have to love it. Because I've, I've grown up all my life absolutely loving football. And if I wasn't a player, then I'd be a coach or I'd be doing, I'd be doing something else because for me, there, there's nothing else. Um, and obviously not everybody necessarily feels like that, but it's so key for you to enjoy it because yes. if you do end up becoming a professional footballer and you love it, then it doesn't become a job. It becomes something that you just love to do and you're able to do that for a living, which is, which is the ultimate dream. Um, so yeah, I think that the key message is you've got to believe that you can do it. So Spread the passion. Yeah, exactly. Here's the message here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's incredible to be sat here talking about the World Cup. So we've talked about the biggest moment. Let's talk about the best team when you predicted before we went into the World Cup. Did you predict a team to, to lift the trophy? And has that changed? Or are you gonna stick with your stick with your guns? I, I'm probably going to get killed for saying this, but I genuinely think the way America have been playing, they are up there to talk to be. I think France have shown vulnerabilities more than what America has, um, but obviously I'd back England all the way because, again, I believe in the girls, but I think if any any game's going to be the worst, I think it would be America because they're so fit, they're fast, they, they've got any goal scorer on the pitch, it's not just one player, you can see so, so many of them can, can, can score. Um, but I, my money was on America at the start because I think they they come into this tournament flying and they've, they've just proven they've grown from strength to strength as, as the tournament's gone on. But um, I'm, I, I'd like to think I'm wrong, very much wrong in that England do go on and win it, but for me it was America. See, I have to say the opposite. So I was more leaning towards France yeah. over America. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And um, that's because I think America had an easy group. I think they absolutely breezed through that group. And as soon as they were tested, which they were by Spain, they crumbled, they made mistakes at the back. Um, obviously, Spain managed to score. Um, I know, obviously, France have made mistakes. Obviously, we've got Wendy Renard's own goal. Um, I think they've been lucky as well. Yeah, France. yeah, yeah. They know they have. They definitely. But I think both teams. It's tough because I think France have been lucky in some aspects. America was lucky in that Spain game. They was lucky to not get picked out by Spain. Um, and obviously, because it's their home nation, I think they've got that little bit of extra boost of confidence. And I don't know. For me, in my opinion, I think that when the USA have been tested at the back, they've looked a little bit more vulnerable than France. So I had to go with France, but obviously I still believe that if England can play to the best of their ability, they've got the ability to beat both of those teams. So if it's not going to be England, which I hope it is, then I think it's going to be France. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. France play USA, don't exactly. they? So one of them is going to be... One of them's going, so that's yeah. good news anyway. And it's nice that they're going... <laughs> an earliest round so you know who is going to be the best before it even hits the final because there's been so many controversies about that so as long as England win, don't care who wins in that game so hopefully they'll go in and beat them as well. It's all to play for and we'll also soon see. How do we all capitalise on, on the success of the World Cup? Um, I think we've got a We've got to keep showing um, women's football on telly um, frequently as well. Um, I think obviously for a lot of people, like when before when it, it wasn't on telly so much or it wasn't sort of put out there as much, um, that's when people become a little bit ignorant to it. Um, but I think there's been such a such a fantastic reaction from the World Cup. Um, and such fantastic sort of viewing figures it shows that there is an interest this was almost sort of the um, almost like the test to see if people would sort of buy into it and get interested and it and then we obviously shown that there has been huge interest when I went out to a couple of the games um, there was it wasn't just sort of women and young girls there was there was men there too wanting to what wanting to watch it as well so um, I think it definitely needs to be televised a little bit more frequently um, and yeah, just sort of 
keep putting it out there more and more and sort of treating maybe from a media point of view sort of treating the women um, a bit more equally and giving them a bit more coverage and stuff like that and I think it will and people will start to have to listen and have to pay attention and, and have to do more and more um, so yeah I just think it just needs to be broadcasted more frequently on the Super League next year yeah, 100%. Like, um, we know like last year a lot of our trophy games were put on TV, whether it be Sky Sports, whatever, but I think all BT Sports, but more can be done. And I think even looking into the sponsors, you've got Barclays, you've got Boots, huge, huge brands that are buying into the UK. Just puts, again, that platform out there to, to everyone, like girls, boys, men, women, that it's starting to grow and get bigger and bigger and again the better the girls can do in this world cup can only bigger the end result for us because we are all trying to fight for equality i know there's a lot of speculation about pay gap and i think realistically it's going to be hard to try and hit that because we know the revenue that the men bring in is ridiculous but that's the reason where we're trying to make it as close to that as possible and like i say barclays and boots coming in as big sponsors is massive for the UK. Broadcasting that across the World Cup. Again, like you say, if it's on BBC TV, like everyone has BBC. So these figures that we're constantly breaking, I even expect us to break even more figures from tomorrow night when, when the girls play again. It just shows how big the game is getting. And God, I remember when I was a kid, there was no women's football for me to watch. And now I'm, I'm watching it all the time. And this can still be even more of that. And I think they can still change the perception of so many people out there, like even from my experience at Chelsea games, there's so many young young boys that are there. It's not just little girls we're trying to like show the game to, it's little boys as well. And, and they get so amazed when they meet like women players. And I think just being able to give that influence to kids and men, women, everyone out there that we are just as good and that we can be just as entertaining to watch as what the men are. Um, it's just unbelievable and again, as you touched on, I think the more we can get it out there, the more media interest we can get in, um, the more attention we get, the more figures we get and the more money helps everyone, even right down to grassroots because there's so many girls grassroots teams now, like for yourself if you want to be a coach, you're going to have so many girls teams, like we never had that as kids, like, I don't know about you but I'd start in a boys team because I, yeah, there no, was no girls teams around. No, not really. No, I couldn't really play football at school. Yeah. You didn't have it in PE or anything like that really, even in secondary school. So it was a, it was a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. So again, I think all of this is just showing how far we've come, even from the last World Cup to now, and um, the achievements that we've made going forward. It's so interesting that you said that you used to play in the men's team at school, and it almost wasn't wasn't really there no. on offer in the school curriculum. Who was your sporting hero then, Beck? A female athlete that you looked up to? Mine was Rachel Young. For me, she was like up there with the best. And um, funnily enough, she just come, uh, took part in soccer aid. So she was going to training at Chelsea in preparation for that. So I was I was starstruck. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm 25 and I'm in the training. I'm like, oh my God, that's Rachel Yankee. Like, even to this day, it was just unbelievable when I got to train with her and and yeah I think she, for me she was up there with the best with like Kelly Stick and that but for me Rachel Yankee was, was my idol. Yeah, I was a big fan of Rachel Yankee as well. I think at the time I used to play up front. Obviously, I've moved all the way back now. <laughs> <laughs> moved all the way back to centre back now. But um, yeah, so I was a big fan of Rachel Yankee. And then as I started moving back, I then become like, a big, big fan of Alex Scott as well. Obviously, two huge legends in the in the women game. Um, obviously, internationally as well. Um, both obviously legends at Arsenal. Um, and when I was younger, you heard most about Arsenal, um, Arsenal ladies at the time. Um, so I think those, and it, and it was not far down the road from me as well, um, where they played. So I used to go and, and watch them as much as I can. So those two for me were, were the two players I watched growing up. Yeah. Alex Scott is making waves in the football world and it's great to see her. He's kind of like the poster girl of the World Cup for the BBC. It's come a long way in the women's game, but there's still a long way to go, like, like you've both touched on. 
fact that 6.9 million people tuned in to see the England see England defeat Cameroon was incredible. But what one thing would you change for women's football going forwards? Um, I think it it would just be the media side of it, just to, just to try and get more exposure to it. I think there's not a lot you you can really change, like. We, we play the game just as equal as the men, the same amount of minutes, etc. Everything I think we just need that exposure out there across as many platforms as possible. I think again, what else has helped is technology. I think we've gone from a, a generation where social media wasn't a big thing, so now you can you can watch games on the go on apps on your phone. Like it's, you don't have to be just sat in front of a TV. Again, in bars and showing them. Everywhere, and the more promotion we get, will help change the women's game for the right reasons and not the wrong ones. Because we don't want to be in a position where we end up fighting for it all and then we take a back seat because we think, oh, we've done enough. We need to, as you say, pass the baton on and keep pushing forward for the next generation to come, the generation after that. And again, the more inspirational women we have leading that front, I'm, I'm sure we'll achieve that, whether or not it's. In 10 years, 20 years, at some point, I'm hoping in my lifetime, we're, we're going to get there. So we um, need it's about exposure and making sure that it helps change and bring the women's game for the right reasons. Not like what VAR is doing right now and killing us in the World Cup, but other than that, I think that's the best thing. Yeah, hit the nail on the head to be honest. It just needs to, as I, as I touched on before, it needs to be put out there more. Obviously, it's only as of recent, it's been a good thing that, like for example, at the, at the Tottenham Stadium, obviously, yeah, there's been pictures of the men and stuff, but there's, there's pictures of my teammates as well, plastered all over the stadium and in the night store as well. There isn't just the, there isn't just the posters of the of the men players, whether it's Chelsea or Tottenham, whatever it is, the players that wear Nike. You know, there's ones of the women as well. You've got, um, it'd be good to have maybe like in those stores a few more uh, like t-shirts and kits that cater for um, the women's side of the game as well. I think I went in a night store not long ago and there's a, 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 um, a t-shirt that says Baptiste, who's one of my one of my teammates. Um, but there was just that one shirt there, and then obviously but you've got like loads of different men's shirts yeah. to pick from, um, and you just had that one shirt, and I mean one shirt, not as in like a few shirts with her name on it, like there was just one shirt. Literally one. <laughs> um, which is still a step in the right direction, but the more you, the more you make it an even playing field, then you're giving people the opportunity to pick, okay, no, I want to go and pick a men's shirt, or you're giving them the opportunity, at least you're giving them the opportunity to go, like, do you know what, like, yeah, my daughter watches Spurs women a lot, yeah, I'm going to go and get her, I'm going to go and get her a Spurs women top, and, and the same for the rest of the other teams, so I think things like that, if you, if you put stuff like that on an even playing field, then at least it's giving people the opportunity to get invested in it. As it should be. It's been so special to kind of end this conversation, this chat about the World Cup. What kind of one thing would you say would summarise the whole tournament so far, Renee? Dramatic. Um, Matt, oh, there's so many words you could use for that because, again, you've gone from seeing a country score their first goal to a team potentially storming off in a round of 16 game. I, I think it's just, it's been overwhelmingly fantastic to see how the different nations have all fought for themselves. But yeah, it's just, it's been magical, but I think it's probably one of the best gets I've seen for women's football and the platform that they've, they've put us on. Um, so I'd just say it's it's been amazing to see all the work that the girls have put in finally being showcased on a national stage for me. For me I'd say it's probably just been like entertaining. Um, I think there's been a lot of criticism about women's football saying that it's dull, it's not sort of as quick as the men's game and stuff like that. Um, but watching the World Cup, personally, I haven't seen many dull games. Um, 
that all the games I've watched, there's, all, there's, there's always been some sort of drama or some sort of shock element or something that's that's happened in all the games and that's what we want in a World Cup, you want it to be competitive, you want to be sitting on the edge of your seat, wondering what's going to happen, I was watching them, um, you should have seen me in my living room last night watching Netherlands Japan, I was going mental, I don't support Netherlands or Japan, but it's completely irrelevant to me, but you buy into yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it was such an entertaining game, um, that I found myself jumping up when I thought Japan was going to score and then they didn't, I had my hands in my head and everything, and, <laughs> And I think that that has, is only going to help people invest into it more um, and, and buy into that, you know, the women's game is entertaining as well and, and can be just as entertaining um, as the men's game. No one's trying to argue or say that it's the same standard, but it can definitely be just as enjoyable to watch. So that's what I think this World Cup was brought to us. We scored great goals just like the men, made great saves just like the men, the exceptional saves. One from obviously England goalkeeper Pine Barnsley, that was an unbelievable save. But even um, Chile's goalkeeper against the US, she yeah, made yeah. some unbelievable saves in that game. So I think again, it just shows how how amazing these players are in, in this World Cup. Like you say, there have been some amazing passes of play, some amazing players like. Goals are plenty. Yeah. What's been the biggest surprise? What nation has made you want to sit there and be like, wow, I was not expecting that? Do you know, for me, Italy have really surprised me. I think the way they conducted themselves and the way they, they oh, I can't even remember what team it was. They, they got a last minute winner, it was the header. Um, but for me, they, they've been pulling out some results that I didn't expect them, them to play. And I, think, I think I read a stat on Twitter this morning about it's like their first time they've ever got to a quarter-finals knockout stage. I think the furthest they'd ever got previous to that was around 16. So just to see an improvement like that in a team that you wouldn't, you'd wouldn't, probably have in the back of your mind because you've got your favourites like France, America, England and all that, but you kind of forget about the underdogs. And for, and for me, Italy have really surprised me this tournament. Um, for me, the biggest surprise, and not necessarily in the best way, has been Germany. Um, I've sort of felt really uh, underwhelmed by them, if I'm honest, because obviously you look at Germany as if they're a big gun, they're, they're going to be top one four. of the, yeah, top four, they're going to be one of the favourites right up there. And I know they haven't conceded a goal, but they've, they've still been only scraping through um, yeah. these games, games that you'd expect them to comfortably win. Um, they haven't seemed like such a powerhouse team. Um, confidence and the, and the mentality in, the, in all the players hasn't seemed sort of what I would expect Germany to be so I, I'm finding myself keep forgetting about Germany in this tournament which is obviously dangerous and you should never count them out of course but you think that you think that you think of them as like, oh yeah Germany are good they're, they're one of the contenders but I've I found myself and, and a lot of other people not really talking about them, um, and that's not and that's quite a surprise in itself. So yeah, I think they definitely need to up their game if they're going to get it. Very interesting. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit here and chat all things World Cup, women's football, and I can't wait to see the sport grow and drive forward. And thank you to Sports Barnville for hosting us today. And we hope you enjoyed watching this. See you next time.